I have. We have uh, only one. Once you get that settled, we have only one other direction for you. Yes. Hold on. Well, let me get this underneath here. Okay. Is this okay? All right. Sure. Yes, I will. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, sir. Not a problem. Thank you. So the only thing I'm going to have to, I'm removing this. Uh-huh. Please do not step into the red, the danger zone. Okay. So, I mean, you can look. You can get pretty close. Right. The camera, if you're here, it looks like you're actually standing right next to it. I get it. Okay. Okay. So, so all I'm asking is just don't go into the danger zone. Okay. And um, I will respect your wishes. Why do you call it a danger zone? I mean, right. does it screw up the focus on the, on the Here's cameras? The story. Three years ago, a little Taiwanese kid went into a, a um, museum holding an iced tea, and he was looking at a $3 million painting, and he tripped and put his fist right through it. Ah, yeah, yeah, So okay. we figure if you trip, there's a good chance you won't put your fist right through it. Okay. That's the danger zone, because these are... This
Okay. Yeah, I got to have you up here. Come on, bright and smiling face like yours. Uh, potentially. Yeah, just until. Spectacle, media, propaganda, a faculty forum with Chris Simpson. Thursday, October 19th, 2017, 11.30 a.m. in the Media Innovation Lab, McKinley 100. Free and open to the public, first come, first seated. Don't forget, light refreshments. Very exciting. All right. Controversies over fake news and media legitimacy have reached the very highest levels of state in at least three global superpowers. Academic specialties such as mainstream communication research and theory, international communication and relations, journalism and others clearly have been taken by surprise. This presentation opens discussion of the spot at which technologies of authority. Yes, that works. Thank you. Put your mute now. Great. Yes, I can hear you. Hold on, hold on. Okay, hold on. Can you see it now? Can you, yeah, can you refresh? Okay. Thank you.
Um, hello, ladies and gents. Uh, I'm uh, uh, Professor Chris Simpson. I'm a professor of journalism here at American University. Uh, and a little bit of background about me is uh, I'm the author or the editor of uh, seven books. Uh, mostly what I've studied is, has to do with either the economy, the economics, or the uh, social psychology of uh, crimes against humanity and uh, war crimes, uh, uh, particularly genocide. So, uh, and those have, have been uh, uh, translated into a number of languages. Okay, um, first thing is that, uh, can we click to, we've uh, had, I've had some um, technical difficulties with the presentation. It's been redone, I think, three times involving at least three Apple computers, uh, to only two of which would speak to each other at the same time. Uh, and uh, so we've had some uh, issues, probably mostly my responsibility, uh, but I'm going to need your patience uh, in uh, working with the slides and with some of the uh, transitions. Uh, the first thing I'd like to ask is, um, the good news about uh, spectacle media and society is that uh, the kids are all right. Uh, today's students are significantly more aware of the issues associated with the internet, with communication generally, uh, and with uh, both the upside and the downside of these tools. Uh, and sig significantly more aware of these things than say five years ago. And that's great. Um, the, uh, and, and people seem to have more experiences with propaganda, spectacle, and that sort of thing. How many folks here have had some sort of personal experience involving uh, propaganda <laughs> or um, uh, those types of things? Hmm? You ever seen some propaganda? There's a guy. Uh, yes? Well, I think I was just saying, you know, we're living in this era. I think that we see propaganda all the time. Okay, and in what form? Certainly, um, I think that that all forms of media um, are carrying some kinds of propaganda at times. Sure, sure, and this presentation too. Right? It's, no, I'm serious. It's, it's making an argument. It's making an analysis that has a point of view, uh, and uh, you know we can get later in the in the talk. We'll get into more what definitions of propaganda are, uh, but. Um, but we can start with that. The first thing I'd like to talk about is uh, two postulates, two ideas uh, that this other stuff is uh, based on. Um, the first of these is that societies reproduce themselves, or at least attempt to reproduce themselves, and attempt to adjust to changing conditions. And what that means, among other things, is that people in societies, including different types of societies, have what's called agency. They have the capacity to change situations. Now, one person by himself, by herself, probably doesn't have a lot of agency. But when you're dealing with lots of people who have common ideas, who act on those ideas, then agency can be quite powerful. Uh, the second is, is that as this reproduction of a society goes on, most societies embrace what is called structural violence. Is this a concept that you have encountered previously? Okay, structural violence are aspects that are built into the structure of society or into particular institutions that hurt people 
by preventing them from getting the things they need for a, a minimal standard of life. And there are many examples of this. Uh, bad water, uh, not enough food, not enough nutrition, no housing, uh, poverty in general, uh, discriminatory approaches to education, all that kind of stuff. These are examples of structural violence. And when you start looking at uh, the world through those eyes, what you see is what, what we view as uh, violence usually, like what you see on television as violence, uh, even including terrorism and so forth, is a very, very small part of the violence in societies. And then a much larger part of the violence in societies usually is overlooked. Usually it's assumed to be sort of built in, oh, that's life. We have 40,000 fatalities from automobiles a year. Well, that's life, right? That's how it's approached. Um, okay, so the, the, the actual violence is pretty small. Then you have what uh, some people call cultural violence. It has to do with at violent things that are built into a culture, discrimination on this basis, that basis, the other basis, you know the list. Lack of education, lack of educational opportunities, um, lack of medical care, that sort of thing. Uh, and then there is, is um, uh, there, there are other types of violence as well. You get the idea. So anyway, as we reproduce the society that has structural violence in it, we reproduce the structural violence at the same time. Why do we do this? I mean, we are trying to ad adapt society to changing conditions and so forth. Well, the simplest answer is, is that parts of society, the privilege enjoyed by some parts of society, is built upon the oppression of other parts of society. Okay, so, think about this reproduction process a little bit. This is a, a, a quote from a guy named Guy Debord, uh, <coughs> written in the uh, uh, 1960s. And he argues that as we go about reproducing societies, that that reproduction process is in fact one of the most important economic, political, and social projects of the whole society. And with that comes both the propagation and the adaptation of myths and assumptions about the inevitability and the desirability of modern life. That this is just what we've got. And it had to be that way because human beings are imperfect, we don't have enough resources, etc. It was inevitable. And if you think about that a little bit, what you'll see is that type of reproduction and the reproduction of ideas and attitudes that go with society, being a major product of that society, now this is very old. You can, you can go back a thousand years and see that for the types of societies that were reproducing themselves during that period, reproducing the ideas and assumptions and myths of those societies, was built into day-to-day -day life of those societies. Okay, let's, uh, okay. So this is, uh, and I'm gonna, I want some input from you about this. Uh, you've probably heard of this ad. How many people have seen this ad? Okay, lots of people. How many people have some ideas about this ad? Not so many people. Well, that's interesting. Okay, well, uh, two things about it. Uh, one is, is this Kendall Jenner, of course, um, and one thing to notice about 
this type of production is that it's tax deductible, right? So that Pepsi, for example, in this case, writes off the costs of producing this little spectacle against their taxes. It's a business expense. And as a practical matter, one thing that that means is the taxes that Pepsi doesn't pay, somebody else pays. Okay, what, can we play this? No, that's, this is the CNN one. Let's do the other one, please. Looks like it's the end of the file. There we go. Excellent. Some said never, but they never done come. Yeah, and took our trust. It's been winning, but the lovers ain't done. Yeah, not on my watch. To call me right away, yeah, if, yeah. telling me how to pray, yeah, if, yeah. won't let us demonstrate. Yeah. Wrong. We are the lions, we are the chosen. We gonna shine out of the dark. We are the movement, this generation. You better know. Okay, what is, uh, okay, we can leave that up for now. Um, what is going on in that commercial? What is happening in that commercial? What did you see? What did you experience? Um, well, Pepsi's trying to play into like the modern narrative of like cultural diversity and showing all these protests that are happening in America. Um, and then, like what I see in it is they're trying to benefit from that. They're trying to sell you something by showing you like what's the reality of what's going on in America. And so I just thought it was very insensitive because protests don't end with the police smiling after getting a Pepsi. Not usually. Okay, other people. What did you see there? Yes, please. Um, 
I thought it was very lukewarm in terms of like a political protest because all the signs were very neutral, like peace, love, join the conversation. And um, it doesn't t exactly take a stand against every anything. And when the people decided to join in, they thought it seemed like they made it seem like it was some kind of revolt, but just people walking down the street with simple signs that I could make that, you know, here. So um, I was kind of like, what by that? But like the Pepsi part about it was just like giving the police a Pepsi, trying to like, oh, join in, come to our side, um, see where we're coming from. But if you look at the signs, I'm like, what exactly are you trying to say? Because there's no position being there's no position being taken and you know not exactly an argument being made so it was just very lukewarm and and um and what she said with how <clears throat> Pepsi was kind of benefiting off you know a lot of protests have been rising up and Pepsi decided oh like oh let's put our spin on it on top of that you see a lot of a diverse cast as well you know you see a lot of people of color and some um and things like um things like that they're, you know they're like um, you see them basically looking at what the consumers are saying. Consumers want to be um, represented, but if you're representing them in that light, it's not the best way. Would you call it propaganda? Mm -hmm. um, oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Just yes or no? Um, I say yes, but not like an effective one. It's their, oh, attempt. <laughs> it's their attempt on propaganda, but I'm not swayed. I'm swayed not to drink Pepsi anymore, but. <laughs> Interesting. It had exactly the opposite effect on you personally as they had hoped it would have. Yes. And my, my view, and I'm a different generation perhaps, <laughs> so um, I actually liked the commercial and I thought the message at the end was um, that we're, at the end of the day, we're, we're the same. We're, we're all people, we like the same, you know, we have the same taste, we have, um, at least that's how I viewed it, and uh, I, I thought that um, Pepsi did actually a great job in terms of uh, depicting the, the diversity and uh, depicting that people are coming from different backgrounds uh, to enjoy, um, I guess, the, the product. That, well, that was the message, obviously, but the message, uh, subliminal message was that we're, at, at the end of the day, we're the same. Okay, others, others. Um, I saw your hand first. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Chris, uh, for this very um, interesting topic. Uh, I am definitely of a gener different generation, and the legacy for Pepsi ads is, this is these are some of the slogans that they've had in the past. Now it's Pepsi for those who think young. Come alive, you're in the Pepsi generation. That was when I was in my formative years, starting at 11 years old, um, you've got a lot of you've got a lot to live. Pepsi's got a lot to give. So I think historically, their ads have tried to appeal to the youth culture, get you all to drink sodas, and trust me, that's the one thing that they're trying to get across: is sell product. And then they're also trying to compete with what Coca-Cola was doing. Uh, you know, peace and love. Let's everybody, you know, get together, have a Pepsi, enjoy you know, life, and yeah, there are some protest signs there. They're not gonna, they're not gonna sell Pepsi by showing uh, people getting beat down, uh, tear gas in the streets. Uh, the other question, is it propaganda? My narrow view of propaganda usually means state-sponsored. So uh, I won't be able to sp spend the entire hour here. I'm gonna catch the rest of you on YouTube Live, but I would love to hear whether you think that the commercial world is propaganda versus state-sponsored propaganda like um, governments, so we go back to Lenny Reifenstahl, Goebbels, and then our answer to that um, in World War II, we had the answer for that to get people to sign up to, to go to war. Um, why we fight is one example. Sure, okay. sure. Um, short answer to your question is that uh, there's certainly such a thing as government propaganda, and it, it has its own dynamics and its own objectives. I think that's propaganda. Okay. Uh, now, I do agree with you that it was a very sophisticated, tailored, um, really kind of top of the line production effort here, right? 
music choice, the people choice, the gestures, that where they're standing at different points in the commercial, who, who uh, signs off on who, who says, oh yeah, I'm with you, all that stuff, right? Which is at least 90% baloney, at least 90% baloney. Um, so looking at it through the eyes of how is it that we reproduce ourselves as a society, we have a situation here where there is a movement among young people. It has particular characteristics. It has particular energy. People are to at least some degree acting with agency to try to change the world or mold it to a world that they prefer. And, and Pepsi says, oh, that's great. We want your energy. And we want you to identify with our brand. And we want you to have an emotional connection to our brand. And the way that we do it is say, whoa, aren't we cool? I call that propaganda. Yeah. Very manipulative ad, uh, even to the extent of having her stand there with the line of police and handing something which was a complete um, appropriation of a recent um, iconic image from a protest. Um, but my question is the difference between what Russell asked you, the difference between the government propaganda and the corporate copper propaganda. Um, in the corporate world, you can turn it off and you don't have to buy the product. And from the government, it's your tax dollars that are paying to get that message out there. And <coughs> as we're even seeing now, some pressure to conform to what the, uh, the leading government perspective is. So m my question is, do you still think it's the same equal sure. propaganda? Well, for one thing, let's go to the question of tax dollars, right? Actually, it's our tax dollars that are paying for this. It's because they write off these production costs as a tax deduction, as a business expense, right? It's not illegal. It's written into the law to do this. So we are incentivizing as taxpayers and as citizens a situation in which Pepsi and Coke between them spend billions, billions of dollars to argue out their sides. Second question, can you actually turn it off? And I'm not sure that that's the case. Yes, we can turn off one thing one time, we can turn the page one thing one time, we can uh, go home and sleep, but you can't turn this stuff off. It is, it is pervasive, 24-7, 365 days a year. Pepsi, 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 Pepsi. Thanksgiving, Pepsi, Christmas, Pepsi, Hanukkah, Pepsi, Easter, Pepsi, Fourth of July, Pepsi, <laughs> Super Bowl, Pepsi. You can't escape it, not really. Okay, to me it looks like Pepsi is a tool that solves issues in this case, mm. but I would like to connect with uh, my country. I come from Macedonia and uh, I am Muslim and uh, there is a propaganda against Pepsi and Coca-Cola in our countries mm -hmm. saying that if you revert to the name on the opposite side then it shows like Prophet Muhammad is dead or give me a bullet to kill Prophet Muhammad. Probably this could be uh, by including Muslims in this uh, advertisement, probably they try to do kind of an anti-propaganda to what it happens on, on other part of the world. Um, fair enough, yes, there are, are contested uh, narratives. Different narratives are contested. They conflict with each other. Uh, it's not just one narrative. So what the thing to do, what I try to do anyway, is to look at the common streams of all these contesting narratives. So in some way, you say Macedonia? Yes. In, I'm not familiar with Macedonian propaganda. I know where Macedonia is. but. Uh, my knowledge is weak. There are th things that are held in common between state propaganda in, for example, China or Russia uh, that are similar 
to the narratives in the United States. And what they have to do with is the glorification of that which it is, the glorification of the reproduction of that society and the values that at least those who can afford to pay for commercials and propaganda, the values that those people say that they hold and want to convey to their people. And, and this, what we'll see later in the, in the discussion is that there is quite often a difference between what a government or a company says they do and what in fact they do. And, and I think that that comes up in the, in the Pepsi commercial. Okay, let's see, um, let's, let's go on. All right, right now in, in our society, uh, there has been a serious loss of legitimacy for uh, both the media and the government. Uh, the uh, Trump election, of course, is Exhibit A, uh, but uh, it really goes considerably deeper than that. Um, the, and, and there's good and bad aspects to this loss of legitimacy, at least to my way of thinking. I think one of the things that, that young people are actually better at than professors and so on is understanding that most of the information we get is approximate. It's not true, or at least it's rarely true in some sort of absolute sense, and it's rarely absolutely false. Rather, it is approximate. It's approximately true. And some stuff is more closer to being true than others. And so you weed through it to try to find stuff that makes sense, that is useful to you, that resonates with you, and so on. That, to my way of thinking, is a good way to approach the world and a good way to approach information sources. It is a, a step away from a society that I grew up with, for example, in which particular newscasters were considered to be, that, this is the voice of reason, right? So to this day, when you have um, discussions about the Vietnam War, for example, people will say the turning point in the Vietnam War is when Walter Cronkite made a criticism of what was going on, the American policy in Vietnam. Why? Well, Walter Cronkite was respected as a moderate, insightful uh, voice of reason. Now, in point of fact, there were <laughs> the, the struggle over the war in Vietnam had been going on for 10 years by the time that Walter Cronkite changed his views. 10 years. The casualties among Americans already, uh, I'm talking about troops now, uh, already were numbered in the tens of thousands. And the casualties among Vietnamese were already at least in the hundreds of thousands and approaching a million. <coughs> so Walter Cronkite comes around and all of a sudden, oh, well, I guess we've kind of made a mistake. Maybe we need to rethink this thing. My point of view is, thank you, Walter. I'm glad you've done this, but you should have done it 10 years ago. Okay, so we've lost legitimacy. This guy is a principal researcher at Microsoft Research, used to be the chief researcher at um, Yahoo. And uh, he wrote a very interesting article, I'd be glad to share it with you, about the loss of legitimacy. And he names the stuff that you're pre pretty much familiar with, uh, fake news or allegations of fake news, uh, allegations of bias, various uh, news organizations, uh, errors, uh, what else? Um, Oh, the you know, climate change denial, all that stuff. Actually, on climate change, the Union of Concerned Scientists have come up with an uh, article that goes back to the early 1950s 
in a uh, journal that, uh, where an Exxon executive says that, look, we're going to have problems with this climate business. It's because burning our product, gasoline, oil, and so forth, pollutes the air. And so we need to start now, this is 1951, we need to start now to offset or stop or block or close down the connection between gasoline and air pollution. And in fact, they pursued that strategy literally up to today at taxpayer expense. It's a business expense. Okay. Um, so he acknowledges the loss of legitimacy. He identifies it as a serious problem for society. And he says, once legitimacy is undermined, it is hard to get back. And that is very true. He, his solution is, let's have a broad consortium of media and technology companies. In other words, Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, Washington Post, united in their commitment to making and evaluating arguments based on evidence and logic, they would hold each other accountable and support each other against outside attacks. Now let's think about that a little bit. Suppose Coke and Pepsi formed a consortium of companies to protect themselves, to embrace these lofty and even important values, at least on paper, and to protect one another when they're criticized, and to support each other against outside attacks. What do you think? Do you think that's a good idea? Nicotine companies do a lot of that, where they work together, um, especially abroad, to ban any form of like advertisements against it. So yeah, I think it'd be an incredibly bad idea if Coke and Pepsi or any of the um, pop giants wanted to get together and try to do that, because I think if it was ever released that pop gives you cancer, like nicotine, you know, like I think that there would be a lot of like pushback from these really powerful like mega billion dollar companies. Uh, the, the history of, of advertising about tobacco is really fascinating. It truly is. Um, and not to get too far off into it, the, the, I'm reinforcing the point that, that you made. Um, they spent millions a, on uh, fake research, essentially, uh, to block legislation. They spent millions on lobbying Congress. They spent millions electing congressmen who would uh, fight against regulation of tobacco. Okay. Um, see, this to me personally, and this is my personal opinion, is an example that is rather similar to the Pepsi commercial. Why? Because he acknowledges that there's a problem out there and it's a serious problem, and the way to get past it is for the most powerful companies to ally with one another and ensure, number one, they've got a good image, and number two, they take care of each other. Is that propaganda? Look, no, let me ask it differently. Suppose what I said was true, and you don't have to believe it. Would that be propaganda? And second, if what I said is untrue or misleading, explain. Point that out. Who wants to take that on? Yes, please. I think it is propaganda. And the problem with that is you create a monopoly of information and control over what should be said or heard for people. Like, for me, I don't know why, but like the example that came to my mind is like a government saying that when information go out, people protest. So the solution for that is to block all kinds of media and only the ones we like will be there. So I don't think that's good by any means. 
Okay. Others? Yes, please. This is such a tricky question because when you first posed it, when I first read the quote, rather, I thought, oh, that seems like a good idea mm -hmm. as from the perspective of a media and technology perspective, which ideally is supposed to be invested in some sort of presentation of truth in, in like you said, there's never an absolute or completely untrue, but, but in the idea, pursuit of truth for the benefit of the public good. But then when you think about it in the context of propaganda, how do you prevent a consortium from creating a monopoly on what information goes out? And then I think in the American context, it becomes even more complex because we have a history of sort of pursuing these ideals of avoiding extreme stances, but yet we're living in an age where our culture is maybe developing into some semblance of, of extreme uh, points of view from government and, and media. And the word media now has been mm -hmm. brought in to include a oh, lot sure. of different perspectives. So, so I don't have an answer, but I just wanted to pose that those two for me make it even more complex than when you first began. I agree, I agree. One of the things about propaganda is that it, and I'm referring now to Stalinist propaganda, Hitler propaganda, any kind of propaganda you want to mention, is that it presents itself as an ideal. It presents itself as good. And, it, and uh, that is as much a part of propaganda as any other piece of it. Uh, did I see somebody's hand? Yes, please. I would see that type of conglomeration as propaganda um, because, you know, sort of like in the same way that traditional uh, propaganda's definition is, you know, government sponsored and governments are institutions and structures, which as much as we want to say they're democratic, often do sort of uh, leave out many perspectives and try to get um, a very sort of like clear and concise message out. That type of conglomeration would be the same. It would be all of these companies coming together to create a structure, an institution that doesn't allow, um, you know, for example, like smaller businesses to get like their um, own perspectives and messages out and would really sort of um, create a sort of like standard throughout the industry. So I would say that it's propaganda. Okay, interesting. In economics, there's a, there's a concept called regulatory capture, which is exactly what you're talking about. Is the, we sometimes set up a group of regulations that it's intended to avoid abuses that have been recognized in the system. Say, for example, railroads in the, in the United States, or you, know, you name it. And then the regulator gets captured by the industry that it is supposed to be regulating. And so that creates a more complex and a deeper problem. So the guy won a, a Pulitzer Prize in economics for, for this insight. OK, let's go on to something new. All right. So public opinion. Public opinion is powerful, as you know. We were already talking about that. Um, but there's also submerged public opinion. And that can be powerfully surprising. Exhibit A is uh, Trump's victory in the past election. Certainly the Democratic Party, most of the media, and I think it's fair to say most of the country, went into that election with the assumption that Hillary Clinton was going to win the election. And there's a lot of reasons why she should have and so forth, but she didn't. And that was a big surprise to the pollsters, to the public relations professionals, to the, uh, the lobbyists, and so on. Next slide, please. This kind of submerged public opinion has significant impact on our lives. So let's say up in that corner, you, it's 1949 in China, and uh, Mao Zedong is announcing the formation of uh, the People's Republic of China. This is after more than 200 years of popular uh, exception, uh, um, acceptance 
of the claim that China is hopefully mired in its own poverty, China would never go anywhere, China can't communicate with anything, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And yet, they succeeded in founding a new country that had radically different approaches. Next, here, so, and that was, a, that was a, a factor, the submerged public opinion in China was instrumental in that. Here in the lower corner, we see another example. This is, you can't see it so well on this particular monitor, but uh, you can see the man standing in front of the tank. This is a famous uh, man who stood in front of the tanks and stopped them for a while in the Tiananmen Square incident. So, Chinese Communist Party comes to power, has absolute or close to absolute control over the media uh, and people's lives, workplaces and so on, for 40 some years. And all of a sudden, at a particular juncture, that broke. That is what submerged public opinion can do. Over here, what's going on? Soviet Union, a follow-on to the old Tsarist Empire, Empire um, 1991. Even the leaders of the Soviet Union thought that they had a handle on public opinion. But as, as it actually turned out, they didn't. Submerged public opinion emerged and broke that empire. And Mr. Trump, or here's another example from the United States, the NRA. Now, think what you will about the NRA and its policies and so forth, but the fact of the matter is, it is a powerful organization because number one, it has lots of money, and number two, it has 15 million members and they vote. That's what makes NRA powerful. And they portray themselves as an oppressed minority. Okay, other side, please. Okay, so propaganda has lots of cousins. Uh, and this goes to the definition of propaganda. In, we in the, in the West, uh, including in Europe and so forth, usually use the, the term as a derogatory label for stuff we don't like. Propaganda is something that the other side does, the bad guy does, whoever our rival of the moment is. That's <coughs> propaganda, ISIS. You won't see, I'm not supporting ISIS, but you won't see ISIS discussed in the newspapers without a, a, a statement that says, ISIS propaganda. Oh, we're losing the propaganda war to ISIS. But in reality, propaganda is central to orienting people and normalizing people in atomized societies. It gives people a way to think about where they are and where they are at home. And frankly, there's, a, uh, there's quite a history of this stream of thought, going back to Walter Lippmann, he's a big time intellectual in communication, uh, to 1922. All right, another one, please. Okay, never in this country refer to any of the following activities as propaganda. Marketing, lobbying, public communication, branding, earned media, journalism. No, never called journalism propaganda. Very dangerous. Or not so much dangerous as shocking. Okay, team building, corporate buzzwords. Truth, never refer to truth as propaganda. But yet we know from our earlier conversation that truth it tends to be approximate. The only truth that is absolute has to do with a religious faith, which by definition involves things that go beyond this world. 
faculty forums, propaganda. Don't call those propaganda. All right, rumors, peer pressure. All right, you get the idea. But in fact, if you look at the history of propaganda, if you look at how these fields develop and how these specialties develop, professional specialties involving people who are serious thinkers and who put a lot of time and effort into it and do their jobs well, this propaganda is what that emerged from. And that's not like ancient history. That's the 20th century. All right, next please. All right, so we go back to why do societies in which we have agency, a capacity to change, a capacity to um, address structural violence, why do we re reproduce it again and again? Any ideas about that? Yes, please. Because we become normalized to accept <coughs> what that fear concept of normalizing, you know, what the truth is and normalizing what comfort is. I think, again, as we've seen in society, change is very hard for people to accept. So if we're being taught to feel that one thing is normalized, change is going to feel like a big wrecking ball through what we understand and what we know. So again, we want to reproduce things that we are comfortable in what we know. And again, change is the exact opposite of that. It can be a real problem. And, and your insight, which I think is true, runs up against the, uh, a different insight or a different narrative, which is that their submerged public opinion doesn't buy into the message, the general message that has been put out in a particular institution or a particular society. Okay. Oh, this is talking about structural violence and why we don't um, address it or address it very well or very consistently. Lots of problems, resource limitations, uh, weak infrastructure, war, et cetera, et cetera. But mostly, mostly, we don't address these things because some factions or parts of society believe they benefit or they actually benefit from the quiet destruction of poverty or oppression of others. Why is it, uh, you know, let's talk about slavery. Slavery was legal. It was in the Constitution. Frederick Douglass in 1844 burned the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution. Why? Well, because it legalized slavery. And his point of view was, I'm not going to embrace this document that legalizes slavery. Now you can question his tactics, you can disagree and so forth, but it wasn't an irrational act. Yet, if you listen to um, some historians, oh, <coughs> Frederick Douglass was such an extremist. Okay, next. All right, um, as I mentioned earlier, we were having some technical issues at the beginning of uh, the, um, uh, today to put together this, this presentation. This is, was to be the wrap up, but I'm gonna do one other things before the wrap up. But I'll give you the wrap up so that you can be ready and say, okay, well, we're about done now. All right. We as people learn things slowly. It takes time to learn things. But then there are junctures in history where we learn very quickly, surprisingly quickly. Late 1980s, early 1990s in the Soviet Union, late uh, early, uh, excuse me, the late uh, 1980s in China. Okay, what I'd like to do is to uh, play a different clip that I suppose I should have played earlier, but nevertheless, we're gonna play it now. So if you could play this, 
I'm, I'm sure you've seen this. You're standing with some, uh, some folks there right now, including a little girl who I guess uh, has to deal with all of this as well. What can you tell us? Let me introduce you to Danielle here. Danielle, you just arrived. Share with us how you were rescued. Some guys had uh, called our phone and asked us where we were. We was waiting for the police for like 36 hours and they never came. And we was waiting at the home. We did the white flags and everything and nobody came. But then somebody had called the phone after we decided to leave the house and we had walked to the gas station with the kids. And then they had called and came and picked us up. But we had been there like five days with, with no food and no lights and nobody came, like nobody came. Now you're with your children. We've heard of stories of, of mothers trying to save their children from the rushing waters. Can you ex tell us how we that was? Through four feet of water to go get them food on the first day. Yeah, that's a lot of shit. But y'all sitting here, y'all trying to interview people during their worst times. Like, that's not the smartest thing to do. Like, I'm people sorry. are really breaking down, and y'all sitting here with cameras and microphones trying to ask us what the fuck is wrong with us. So I'm so and you're really trying to understand with the microphone still in my face, sorry. with me shivering cold, with my kids wet, and you still putting a microphone sorry, in my face. Sorry. Uh, Russell Flores, uh, it sounds like you've got a very upset family there. Uh, we're going to take a break uh, from that, uh, and we'll get back to you later on. Uh, Russ Flores in Houston for us. Thank you. Uh, along the Texas-Louisiana border, scenes like this as hundreds of residents are rescued from their flooded out homes and brought to safety. A live report when we come back. Okay. What happens in that video clip? There's a mother. <laughs> There is a mother who is cursing at the person who is trying to interview her in front of her child, actually, and that was something that I noticed, is that she doesn't want to be interviewed for an incident that happened because of the flood and the hurricane. She just wants to be left alone. She doesn't want news media coverage. She just wants people to be aware of it, it seems like. And she's like, get the F out of, the, out of my face. Get like out of here. We're all wet. My daughter is wet. And the fact that she's saying it in front of her daughter, I think, was just very like, interesting, I guess. Okay. More? What else is happening in there? And compare it, if you can, or at least hold both the Kendall Jenner uh, advertisement and this incident in your two hands. They're not the same, but are there qualities to the two that are, are similar in those two? Yes? Um. <clears throat> Well, to be honest, I understand where the mother is coming from, how she doesn't want um, these cameras, but at the same time, we use the media in a way to take it from there and spread it across the country because now we saw firsthand, which also helps people feel sympathy and um, makes us want to donate and help them out. Sure, sure. More? Well, we've got two different people. I'm sorry, are you, okay. do you want to make a comment? Yeah. Please. So what I saw was that the Pepsi ad was sanitized and that the CNN interview was real. And when it was so real, it made us uncomfortable, they had to cut away. Okay, what, what I understood from, from this is that uh, they were trying to show like the country is not doing anything for those people. Mm -hmm. When she said that no policemen come, we, we were five days without food. Come on, if you will stay five days without food, it is difficult for you to stand on your knees, on your legs for sure. Mm -hmm. So to me it looks like kind of a propaganda against the state that did not react on time. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. More? There's a hand up in the back. So I have two quick points. So um, the first one is, so in the Pepsi ad, you see, um, you know, suddenly, like with Pepsi, um, the police and the protesters are, are brought together, um, which is very much like not what happens. And then here in, in, this, um, in this interview, what you see is, is just that, that the police, um, in this case, didn't come and, and they didn't help her. And so what you kind of see is that like, the Pepsi um, ad 
kind of sort of was um, tone deaf and kind of missed a lot of like what's like real to people. And then my second point is, it's it's very tricky I think to kind of uh, deal with these types of situations, um, like interview wise, because I think that it is important um, to to get these stories because these stories, like somebody said earlier, do motivate us to to get involved and to donate. But at the same time, it's very difficult to place like the onus and place it all on the victims. Um, you know, I think it's. You obviously want to get the what's going on like visible, but um, putting the victims in the middle of it is can be very sort of like triggering for them. So it's it's a very difficult, tricky like line to walk. Others, yes, please. Yeah, um, the, the, the slide that's up there now. I noticed I noticed you've been using this slide with the misanthrope um, as a symbol for this conversation, and I wondered what what symbols that brings to mind for you and how that relates to this. Um, I, it's actually kind of a joke on me. Oh. It is, yeah, it's true. That's why, I mean, it's a, it's a dramatic image, yes, and that's part of why I chose it. But also is that um, people who bring bad news to others are viewed as misanthropes and uh, socially isolated. And I thought that this was a joke about how I deal with the world. You asked, I answered. Um, okay, but let's go back to the, uh, the, uh, the CNN clip real quickly. To me, that clip has something really important to say about the loss of legitimacy by media and also by the government. But this is mainly about the media, that one. And that is, I read into it that that woman is furious. She views the reporter, who's by all accounts is a nice person, she views the reporter as a, these are my words, not hers, a millionaire helicopter journalist who has arrived wearing clothes, her outfit is costs more than the rent on this woman's apartment, right? I mean, you can just see it. And is dealing with the situation by putting the microphone just like that. Just a minute. Um, and she becomes enraged at this situation. And this is not the first time this sort of thing has happened. What's the name of that guy, David, David? Oh, the, the uh, oh, I'm sorry, I have it written down. Um, that one of the problems with journalism, especially high-priced American television journalism, is that it, is viewed by people who are on the receiving end as predatory and as having an agenda of taking stuff from others in order to create the reporter's own narrative. It's happened to me. And I think that that, that, that is part of the driver for the loss of legitimacy of particularly American media. Okay, we need to wrap up. Um, and so final comments, on, especially on this bit about loss of legitimacy? Yes, please. Um, is it only like loss of legitimacy for the media itself or for factors in the society? Like if the person, if the reporter was a person of color I, I would believe that the reaction would be different because reporting is like when you put this lens that you don't really feel what's happening in the society, you get rejected. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it when I was reporting in Egypt. It's like when a foreigner re is reporting on a case and like talking with a victim of her husband de de died in the prison, they, they become a bit aggressive because sometimes you just have this lens and perspective of not being there, not 
not feeling what's really happening. Mm -hmm. But if it's someone else that lives in the society or that understands really what's happening, the reaction is different. And maybe you're asking the same questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if the reporter was a person of color, but I think from what your comments are saying, uh, class, the production value of that interview, of what you're saying is the, the woman who's stranded with her children looking at this reporter who's makeup and wardrobe, and then you have the camera and the lights, and when you hold that next to the Pepsi commercial, um, to me it seems like as a device, the loss of um, leg legitimacy is taking these very complex, emotional um, issues and distilling them in a way that perhaps is designed to make it accessible to a greater public, but, it, but then has deleterious effects on the people who feel that it is an attack on them or a, sure. a, for, a, a foreign a person or points of view that is uh, taking their story, distilling it to create a narrative that's different from the people who actually, from their own view, from their own sure. view whether it's the protesters in the Pepsi commercial or, or the woman stranded. When you ask that question, that's what I, I thought about most. That stands out, the, the production value of propaganda. Uh, excellent, and that's a, I think that that's a good spot to, to wrap up for today. And I thank you very much for coming and for the questions and the comments, who, which are in some ways the most important stuff that <laughs> happened here today. So thank you, thank you for coming. I need to especially thank Sadie, who has uh, been all morning long. What happened is, is that we had a meltdown of this whole presentation. And all morning long, she's been working on it to try to restore it.